You're watching Leafs Morning Tape with host Nick Alberga and former NHLer Jay Rosehill. The show starts now. We have reached the pinnacle of the NHL regular season, and here we are again to tee up the Stanley Cup playoffs. Nick Alberga and Anthony Stewart uh, getting set for Elise Bruins' first round. What's going on, Stewie? I'm doing well. How are you doing today? Uh, better than a lot of Leafs Nation. You know you've worked in this market for a long period of time. The ups and the downs and losing four straight to finish the regular season. We're calling out our star players again. And, oh, yeah, the playoffs start on Saturday. Yeah, and I'm sure we're going to get into it uh, in a few moments here too, but uh, how do you know this wasn't part of the master plan to tank a couple games and instead of announcing we want Florida, maybe they just quietly went around uh, the back way in wanting to get Boston first round. Who knows? Who knows? It's funny you bring that up because I did a hit in Montreal earlier today on TSN 690 and I was you know, pulled that question like, do you think the least preferred Boston over Florida? And I'm like, man... If they're trying to handpick their opponent, there are bigger fish to fry in this market because Stewie, you know as good as I do. Uh, they've lost to pretty much everybody in the playoffs over the last 10 years, right? Yeah, but I, I think this group's different. And, um, you know, they have a little bit more depth. I think they have, um, you know, some of their stars have matured. They know the market that they're in. They know if they don't come up and show up and have a good series, what's the, the ramifications of that? So I think, yeah, despite the four-game loss, um, I'm still optimistic for this group too. And again, yeah. I think if there was a four game winning streak, um, I think you'd be the exact opposite. Like, oh, the cup's going. So I think you just have to stay even keel. And I think that's been the key to the Leafs this year. They've been even keel, no high, too high, no low, too low. But we know sort of what the four games slide, you know, one of the main culprits and what it was, was trying to get Austin Matthews his 70 goals. So, um, you know, it, it was it a distraction. Maybe, maybe not. But again, they were resting some guys. Some other guys were coming in, getting opportunities. They weren't sitting there planning with their game plan or their lineup to try to go on a four game win streak going into playoffs. It was a pretty cringe process. We're going to talk about that. So Matthews ends with 69 goals. What an unbelievable season. Uh, nominated for the King Clancy yesterday uh, on and off the ice leadership qualities. I was going to ask you too. like, do you think there comes a point in time, whether it's when John Tavares leaves or he resigns that, he hands a C off. Do you think he needs to do that? Do you think you, you need to have Matthews wearing the C at some point? I think so, right? When you think of the Leafs greats and, and Gilmore and uh, Sundin and Wendell Clark, those guys all wore the C here, and they're synonymous with being leaders uh, with the Toronto Maple Leafs. And, yes, there's a lot of great candidates over the years. You know, is it going to be, you know, Morgan Riley, who was expected possibly to get it last time too? But I think when you think Toronto Maple Leafs, you think, Austin Matthews. That's the first name that pops into your mouth, into your mind. Uh, when you're at the ranks, there's Matthews jerseys. You know, he's growing the game where there's Toronto fans, every other market uh, in, in the United States. I did a lot of traveling this year with my work with the NHL and I would see Austin Matthews jerseys in the mall at Colorado. So he is, he is a leader. Uh, he's a big, big part of this Maple Leafs team. And I believe he's the face of the franchise and should wear the C if John Tavares uh, is, is, is leaving uh, at the end of his contract. Do you think there would ever be a scenario and you probably know John Tavares where he would be like, you know what, Austin, this is your time. I want to resign with the Maple Leafs, but like he hands the C off or do you think we're looking too much in depthly into that because like the example i like to bring up is like everybody thinks like i mean if you think of colorado you think of nathan mckinnon but you forget he is not the captain of that team right yeah but look where it's gone wrong right we saw with joe thornton patty marlowe in san jose where else did we see it was it uh kopitar and dustin brown yeah. in in la as much as you say that's a good thing i think it just adds a little bit of uh, animosity towards the group and we saw uh with blake wheeler you know not getting to see or taking the see off him in winnipeg that was his ticket out of town so i think um regardless of Tavares has it. I don't think he's one of those guys that's a raw, raw type of guy. There's other guys that step up in, in front of the microphone. He sort of leads and just quietly going about his business where I think he was best hand, he was best um, suited to be the captain at the time because with this media and the media business that we're in, they're looking for something in every single word that you say. So for him to come up to the mic and essentially say everything and saying nothing at the same time, uh, he was the safe choice uh, for the Toronto Maple Leafs. Yeah, and big on learning lessons too. I could only wonder what's going to transpire this spring if uh, something happens again to the Leafs. Is JT going to come out and talk about learning lessons again for when he's 50 years old and I, maybe he's still on the Leafs and they're trying to win in the Stanley Cup playoffs. But 
I digress. Uh, I'm with you on that front. Uh, what an incredible year for Austin Matthews, and hopefully that translates to Stanley Cup playoff success. I will tell you it's going to translate to the opening of Greta Bar YYZ, April 26th, the Friday. Circle it on your calendar if you're in the area. Make your way down there, deep in the heart of King Street West, downtown Toronto. Greta Bar will act as your go-to spot for all the hockey playoffs and baseball coverage you can handle, whether you're pre-gaming, looking to watch the big game, post-gaming, or just looking to dust your friends off at some arcade games. Greta Bar YYZ will have you covered with delicious eats and thirst-quenching drinks. Go big. Go to Greta Bar YYZ. Rest assured, I'll be there at Greta Bar probably religiously and looking forward to that. Also looking forward to the Bleed Blue campaign as I showcased on the show earlier this week. I got my t-shirt ready to go for game one of the Stanley Cup playoffs. The playoffs are near and we are ready to bleed blue. Nation Gear is uh, ready to gear you up for Toronto's playoff run. Rep your favorite team as they battle for the Cup. Shop the exclusive Bleed Blue playoff tee and more at nationgear.ca. I won't lie, Stu, it's... it's it's a weird feeling because I feel like 82 games went like that. And now it's like, this is the real conversation. And, and Rosie hates when I bring up the fact that I don't think the regular season matters very much, at least for this Maple Leafs team. And I can't believe we're here uh, mid April and we're ready to tee up game one of the Stanley cup playoffs. It's crazy how quickly time flies. eh? Yeah. It just seems with this group, the evaluation point on if they're uh, evolving is the playoffs, but Again, I think they've done a great job in setting themselves up, knowing that they were probably going to be a team in that two or three slot. I don't think they really had aspirations of trying to win that President's Trophy, but they knew most likely they're getting prepared to play the Florida Panthers or the Boston Bruins. So, um, you know, it's it's tough to just look ahead to the playoffs. A lot of great things have happened during the regular season. Austin Matthews obviously scoring 69 goals. Uh, you know, you saw Samsonov, the storyline there of him going down to the minors, coming back, playing some great hockey. Martin Jones uh, stepping in and playing some great hockey the emergence of jo joseph wall um you obviously know about domi and bertuzzi stepping up matthew nye's coming in robertson so the saga has been long and then plentiful with the storylines with toronto um and that just i think shows the evolution of this group whereas years past it was typically about all the things going wrong why hasn't this guy stepped up what was going on with the power play mitch marner hasn't scored a power play goal in, in two years so i think right now there's a lot more positives and negatives so that's why me personally i feel that's a different feeling with this group uh, going on into the playoffs. So I'm sure next week when we have a conversation, it can and could and possibly will be a different story. But I think if I'm the coaching staff and I'm the players, I'm going into this playoffs feeling positive and energetic about the run that they're about to make. Certainly facing their demons here in the form of the Boston Bruins. Speaking of which, Claude Julien, who was around for that 2013 win, we all recall what transpired in that series where it felt and the Leafs really had Boston dead to rights. And then, yeah, game seven, that third period OT happened. Uh, Claude Julien, who was behind the bench for the Boston Bruins in that game, 2011 Stanley Cup winner, uh, the winningest coach in Bruins franchise history is going to drop by here, Stu, in about 20. Yeah, and he's one of the you know most respected uh, former coaches of the National Hockey League. He just found a way to instill structure in all the teams that he's coached. Very uh, well liked by a lot of his players and um, I think for him, he teaches a lot of the young guys to play the game the right way. So for me, I've had, uh, you know, some good, good coaches. And uh, the feedback that I've gotten on Claude is he's he's really, really good structure, uh, really well liked. So it's tough to be a great coach and a great person at the same time and well liked. Uh, he checks all those boxes. Looking forward to that interview in 20 minutes from now. And again, we have you covered here at the Leafs Nation where it's pregame, postgame, anything you can want. Uh, Leafs Morning Take going to be live as per usual. Don't forget about the Leafs Nation after dark, uh, directly following every game with Zach Phillips. That's going to be a lot of fun. And and we're all going to pop on there too. You're going to see Stewie on there. You're going to see me on there, Rosie, Hutz. Uh, all systems go here for the Leafs Nation team here in the Stanley Cup playoffs. You're watching right now. Hit that subscribe button. Hit that like button at the Leafs Nation 401. Leafs Morning Take, wherever you find your podcast, make sure to leave us a five-star review. And don't forget, visit theleafsnation.com. A lot of great coverage coming your way over the next couple weeks. And hopefully it's like the next couple months as we get set for game one of the Stanley Cup playoffs on Saturday night in Boston. Brought to you by DoorDash. It's time for the appetizer for a limited time. Our listeners can get 25% off, $10 in value. And zero delivery fees in their first order of $15 or more when you download the DoorDash app. Enter code NATION25. That's code NATION25 
All in uppercase, 25% off your first order with DoorDash. Offer valid in Canada. Subject to change. Terms apply. So we're not going to dissect and recap completely what transpired in game 82. But what was your just general feel leaving the 82-game slate and how this season ended, Stu, for the Maple Leafs? Um, Again, I think a little bit of the structure was a little bit... Uh... Uh, lack thereof last night a lot of those goals they just seem to be you know sort of coasting through it looked like a bit of a a uh, a pond hockey game on the defensive side of the puck but let's not forget they were missing a bunch of players last night and and riley edmondson mckay mcmahon domi that's a that's a good third of their lineup where guys who are big contributors and are expected to have big roles with this leafs team in the playoffs so uh for me it, you know going into the playoffs you want to have your identity you want to have your culture set and i think they got a bit away from that the last you know five six games of the season but Again, when you're trying to get Big Poppy his 70 goals, <laughs> you know, you're going to go above and beyond. And I think some of that structure went out the window last night, but they did everything they could to do it. You know, he had 12 shots last night. They were trying to overpass, maybe trying to get some off his back or his, or his butt going to the net there too. But, uh, you know, you're looking at last night, you know, is it a complete disaster? I would say no. You're seeing uh, uh, Brody score his first goal and, and how often, uh, you know, you saw Reeves on the ice scoring his goal. He was on for two goals, four so I think the last couple of games, other guys have been stepping up. Um, the depth has been there. Um, it's not just the big four and 4D stepping up. You're seeing Robertson playing some good hockey. So I like the complementary pieces those last two weeks as you're going to need these guys. These complementary guys have been stepping up and proving that they belong, but having significant roles uh, with this team. So if I'm Sheldon Keefe, I'm, yeah, I'm upset that we lost four in a row, but you heard his comments yesterday. He's like, well... I, I don't even wasn't even paying attention. I was we're going to get Boston. to those. I was watching Boston uh, highlights. Uh, sure, you were in the in the intermission, right? So again, I think he's playing a little bit of that media game, but yeah, he's a little bit disappointed. But they're going to be evaluated that first period of Game One versus the Boston Bruins. I think they're going to come out flying. To me, again, Sheldon Keith, we're going to get to this conversation, but he strikes me as a guy who knows his job's on the line. Man, just so, some of the outrageous things he said in the media in the last week alone. I genuinely feel like this started to become a distraction. 70 goals when he referenced it being a distraction. Like it was going fine. Everything was great. And then all of a sudden it became a distraction for Sheldon Keefe. And he just strikes me as somebody who knows his job is on the line. If he doesn't, he should know because this is a big time of year. You talk about Austin Matthews, uh, 12 shots on goal. It's kind of fascinating you bring up his name because uh, last year or last night, I should say, I had a former player who uh, won a Stanley Cup in the last decade, we'll say, reach out and ask me, like, he he felt like they really weren't gunning for, for Matthews. Like, he felt like they're really passive and shooting the puck when they should be feeding him. I don't know. I didn't feel the same way. How did, how did you sort of break down the way did they go after the appropriate way in terms of his line mates and his teammates? Well, I think... You know, if I'm going for 70 goals, the the Tampa Bay Lightning is probably the the team I probably do not want to play the most, just because I think they did a lot of great job in taking away the passing lanes to him, where they forced him, they forced the they forced his teammates to shoot the puck, right? Some of those times he was on the flank and and getting ready for that one yeah. t, and they had you know one two sometimes three guys in the lane there are covering him, so they forced them to sort of look elsewhere. But Austin Matthews all year. Uh, just think about a majority of those goals. He's created his own shot selection, right? Whether he's coming in, swinging out the zone, coming down the pipe, or you know, being on the flank, he creates a lot of his own shots and his own offense. So, um, twelve shots. He did everything he can to get it. I'm sure he wanted to get seventy, but I don't think it's the end all, uh, be all. But you know, it is the NHL. Guys want to score. Guys want to put up their points. And yes, they want to help their teammates out. But if I'm trying to get to thirty goals or fifteen, I'm shooting that puck too. But I've had teammates in the past where. Um, they were going for, um, you know, bonuses where they needed to score goals and guys weren't passing to them on purpose. So <laughs> I've seen both sides of the coin here. Uh, but I think for Austin, he did everything he can to get it. But I think at the end of the day, it's not going to matter because he'll be right back in the hunt next year, the way that he's firing on all cylinders. Yeah, maybe he hunts 75 or 80 next year. This guy's Funny posts. Good. I heard all the I, – I've, how many times have you tweeted about him hitting the posts, right? And, no, dude. Right? I how many? I want to hear the analytics once. on the inside of the post. How many of those had an opportunity to go in? Sometimes it's the side, it's the top. Yeah, you've been tweeting about those posts a lot. I tweeted about that once, and I'm still getting – like people in my mentions just chirping me about that like 
the guys on a, like I had Oilers fans coming at me. Well, he only finished with five more goals than Connor McDavid, but it's like, yeah, where's the longevity? McDavid had 32 tucks this year, dude. That's 32 less than fucking last year. Matthews, third Rocket Richard Trophy win in the last four seasons. There is nobody even in this guy's ballpark. He has his own stadium. It's Yankee Stadium, and it's only Austin Matthews in that stadium. So I want to get that out of the way for the Oilers fans who think McDavid's this best goal scorer in the league because he's not. There's not even a conversation. I'm sorry to the Reinhardt family. I'm sorry to the Hyman fan. There is nobody in the ilk and the vintage of Austin Matthews scoring goals. I want to get to the Sheldon Keefe quote, and you're Mr. Level-Headed on this podcast. I thought it was an outrageous comment and credit to producer Vic for flagging it after the game. But this is what Keith said on Willie Nylander. I think in the last week, Willie's sort of shown that he's done with regular season hockey. He's ready to move along, but I'm not worried about Willie. So what were your thoughts on that? To me, I think to start, this is classic Sheldon Keefe knowing that he can rib Willie Nylander in the media because that's what gets him going. And if you were to pull me right now, I wouldn't like I, I wouldn't be shocked at all if Willie Nylander is the best leaf on the ice for game one in Boston on Saturday. But how did you read that? Because, man, we want to talk about accountability in this market. And Keefe tried to pull the uh, accountability card a couple times down the stretch. That is outrageous to me. Eleven and a half sheets a year. This guy fucking mailed it in two months ago, man. <laughs> Well, sometimes, you know, the, the, the paychecks and the, and the cash weigh you down a bit, but he knows Willie Nylander more than probably we do and anybody on this Maple Leaf team does. So he knows what buttons to push and when to push them. And again, you mentioned and alluded to that his job might be on the line. Is he going to make comments that's going to make Willie hate him, knowing that he could completely shut it down in the playoffs? I know his track record hasn't shown that, but I would try to stay on the positive front. And again, I've played with teammates that – when the coaches say anything to them negatively, they would legitimate shut it down for a month. So there's some players, yeah, you can rip on. I would, I got chirped every day when I was in Atlanta by the assistant coach. Every single day told me where to go. But he knew that I had the mentality and the personality to be able to handle that. So I think with Nylander, I know he wants to be better. I'm sure he wanted to get 100 points. Now that probably doesn't even matter now that he's got his, his big, big ticket. But I think for Sheldon Keefe, he knows I can't. I got to rally this group around everybody. I can't be now having guys doing it out of spite or trying to hate me because, yeah. again, the, it, there's a lot riding on this playoff series. This team needs to go on a serious run to keep the core intact, to keep the coaching staff intact. So I think for him, he's probably taking the high road. We're not going after Willie in the media. But I'm sure, you know, they've had some conversations behind closed doors. And when coaches go to the media, they almost do that as a last case resort. They don't just go after one game and say, yeah, I'm going to go chirp a star player. There's a build up towards that. So I'm sure after there's a couple of games into the playoffs, Willie's not going. You'll hear from Sheldon Keefe and probably be a little bit more honest. But he's playing that media game, knowing that every single word when he's in front of that podium is being dissected. I'm sure he didn't want the headline being uh, going into the playoffs. Willie needs to be better. We all know that. We all know that. He knows that. The team knows that. The city knows that. Carlton the Bear knows that as well. Yeah, we got to change the mascot, but that's a story for another day. It's the softest mascot in professional <laughs> sports. Uh, but um, if, if he wanted to achieve that, he didn't because I named the fucking podcast Done With Regular Season Hockey. I... Like, dude, that would be like me mailing it in for the last six weeks of this show and showing up like once a week and being like, you know what? I'm I'm done with this regular season conversation. I'm done with the 70 talk. Get me to when the games matter most and I'll perform at my best. I, I just think if you're preaching this accountability, you look like a hypocrite if you're Sheldon Keefe. And uh, the only thing I took away from that is he he knows he can rag on Nylander a bit and throw some shade and he knows he's going to get the best form of Willie Nylander. Like, God forbid he did that to Mitch Marner or something like that because this guy... Another guy who's, you know, there's some question marks heading into the Stanley Cup playoffs about his play late in the season. It would be a different story. He'd be getting texts from his dad, phone calls from his dad, everything, all of the above. I just, Nylander, I don't, it, it, it stinks, I think, from a least perspective and as somebody who covers and follows and likes the team that you just committed like the next almost a decade to this guy and he's had enough of regular season hockey with six weeks left. Like it's not just the last week when you read the quote. It's been the last, like, six weeks. 11-game um, goal of Stroud, Stu. He had five measly points over his past 13 games. I can't believe he didn't get to 100 points. Like, Mitch Marner uh, still has more points in a season than Willie Nylander. If I told you that three weeks ago, he called me crazy. But this guy just shut down. I don't know if he was in, like, Puerto Vallarta or, or Cancun or something. But 
it's appalling. It is appalling when you're paying a guy that much money where he's like, you know what? Not going to play the last couple games here. Yeah. Again, it's, I'm not Am overreacting, Stu? Yeah, I think you are. Um, again, he could be nursing an injury, but I think he's got the track record where, like, I think he's got enough equity where let's evaluate him after round run or after at least game two or three, right? And again, I think he's shown that he's a guy that shows up and has been the most consistent Maple Leafs in their most recent playoff runs. Uh, but no one knows what he's going through. And again, there is that expectation. But the one thing I can guarantee you, if he was sitting here without a contract, the narrative would be, oh, Willie Neant, Leadlander's contract or lack thereof is, is a distraction. We need to sign this guy. He's the only guy that shows up in the playoffs. So we got to show both sides of the coin here because if he wasn't signed long term and they lost first round, they would be blaming that. So um, I think the issue is you have the big four, you have four stars. And again, when I played with, and we didn't have a lot of stars, but when we had two or three, there tends to be not enough puck, not enough opportunity, and you could tend to sort of take some games off because you know Austin Matthews is going to step up. Marner's going to step up JT. So he's one of those guys where he is a star in the National Hockey League. Yes, it would be great to see him get 100 points, but this is the guy that why he earned this contract, and that's why I didn't understand why people are talking about, oh, he's going to be on pace for over 100 points. He's earned this contract for what he does in the playoffs and you play a premium for that. So let's see how it goes. I'm not giving him a, a pass, but let's see how this playoff goes before now evaluating his season as a whole. Wait, 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 run the tape back. These guys have earned their contracts based on what they've done in the Stanley cup playoffs. You can't be serious. I'm talking about William Nylander. He's been the most consistent guy where rain, yeah. sleep, sh shine, Fair. right? Not the yeah. other guys, 70 goals, other guys, hundred points, other guys are putting up assists, right? So we'll, we're we'll paying everybody here, dude. Yeah, I'm yeah, I'm coming. I'm coming back. I'm getting paid. Fuck, they might pay you. On. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. I just I want. You're going to be more... the first guy. You're waiting for that parade, Nick, and I know you want to be hard on them, but you're going to be the first guy. Shirts off, high fiving Willie, drinking a beer with him, and all that. So I'm again, not in a position where I'm taking my shirt off. I just it's our job to evaluate and criticize yes. it sometimes too. But yes. I, I I genuinely have a different feeling. And in the NHL, we talk about five game segments. Majority of their five game segments have been positive. They had an off five game segment as they, they lost four in a row. But on the, uh, when you look at those segments, it's a lot more positives than negative. So I have a different outlook, a different feeling with this group. T flight writes in holy negative ass show LMAO. Nick is feeling it. Yeah. I'm in one today. I, I just, I get constant like reminders like once every couple of weeks where the Leafs are they a serious team like that question goes through my mind just watching the last couple of games and that quote from Sheldon Keefe threw me man like this is like a marquee player on your roster and you you're saying that well, this guy didn't show up for work uh, at least mentally over the last six weeks and last week and it's like perplexing to me but let's look at positives. TJ Brody, 111 games, he finally scored a goal. I thought it was hilarious that Austin Matthews is there, but again we're just we're just trying to feel positive about our jobs and our lives. Uh, Ryan Reeves, great one tee shot, the fourth line. Like that's that's a bigger story for me is the turnaround for Revo. I think he's going to be on that game one roster. But I guess we can translate that conversation. Claude Julian's coming up in about uh, five to seven minutes or so here. But they're playing Boston, man. Um, it didn't go according to plan in the regular season. But everything you saw in the regular season threw it out the window, right? You you throw it out of the window or you sort of look at something for them to build on, right? Especially teams, you know, the you know, it's a reset button for the penalty kill, right? They have the ability now to sort of correct that wrong that has been a big wrong this whole entire season. The power play has been great. Um, but I think you have to build on those things that have been the positives, right? They have the depth. There's been talk about you need 13, 14 forwards, you need seven, eight, nine D. That's been the case with this group. So you can't just say, yeah, throw it all out the window and just uh, hit a reset. And after uh, one game, if they're not going, we're going to switch it up, put Marner back with Matthews. You have to build on the things that have gone well this whole entire season. So um, they have a lot of problems in, in figuring out who's going to be on that, you know, bottom six, which D are going to be coming in is going to be Labushkin is Brody in and out of the lineup, but that's a good problem to have. And they didn't have that luxury in years past. So, yeah. Uh, for me, again, you, you, yeah, you, you throw some things out of the window, but you got to build on those positive that's going to help be help you be successful in the playoffs. The matchup game is going to be huge, man. Like up the middle, Bergeron and Krejci are no longer there, but again, there hasn't been a drop off with Zaka and Coil. But to that point, I think that's a matchup that the Leafs want to try to get the best of 
whether it's breaking up the, the, the big boys, the big three, if you will, into separate lines and configurations. I think we're going to see everything here from Sheldon Keefe. But the way I look at it, and I brought this up on Thursday, I think you can make a clear case. The Leafs have the better forwards, Boston, the better blue line. And ultimately, to me, Stu, it comes down to goaltending. Would you agree? I, I'm not going to disagree with you, but I think it's going to come down to which best players are going to be playing the best. And and that's why I handicap Toronto being the favorite versus some of these teams. And I know history has not proved me right, but when Toronto's top guys are playing at the top of their games and consistency has been their issue, they've dominated a lot of the top teams in the national hockey, league, the Colorado's and stuff. So I think for them, they've been giving up a lot of leads. I've, I've understood that, but if they get that defensive structure in the playoffs, they get some goaltending, but ultimately when Nylander's on, Marner's on, Tavares and Matthews, three out of the four, or two out of the four many times, and they get the saves, this team dominates for majority of the games. And I think the issue is sometimes they have some lapses, 10, 15 minutes. Uh, the penalty kill lets them down. But playoff time, this is where guys earn their paycheck. And I think this group is different because they're year older. They have a lot of experience now. They have all experience in losing. And on the negative side, if they're at the top of their game, and I think for majority of the season, a lot of them have, that's why they are in this position. So that's why I think they could beat Boston and I think they could beat Florida. And then, you know, what's going to go on in that conference finals versus uh, is it going to be the Rangers or is it going to be Carolina? But I handicap them being the favorites if all those guys are playing at the best of their abilities. It's uh, crystal clear in my mind. This Leafs team can beat anybody in the NHL. I think they've proved that year in and year out, um, more so obviously in the regular season. It's the same old story. Again, it's cliche. We talk about it every spring. The big guys have to be big. The power play is going to be a big factor. If you do recall the last couple of years, uh, for all the conversation we have about that top five power play in the regular season, different story in the playoffs. And I think depth is going to be huge. That's why I think it's a big development. The fourth line has played really, really well. They've been chipping with some goals. You need that offense from guys like Robertson and McMahon when he gets back and healthy and, and nice. Like, you have to spread the wealth. So I know a lot of the focus and and like the face of the team is like, you know, Marner and, and Matthews and Nylander and those guys, you have to spread the wealth and the timeliness of the goals. Like that was my takeaway from the series win against Tampa, Ryan O'Reilly's DNA over everything. Kerfoot scored a big goal. Like it was this, it was that it's got to be a team thing. Yeah. And, you know, say what you want about guys like, um, you know, camp, you know, he's got two goals in his last 10 games or five games yep. since he's been back as well too. Dewar has been doing a great job on the penalty kill. You saw Ryan Reeves rejuvenate his game and revive his career after, um, you know, some of the fans that are in this exact chat trying to run him out of town too. Uh, Robertson, just the adversity he's gone through this whole entire year. Uh, Holmberg, you know, he was down in the minors, came back and, and earned a regular spot as well. Nyes, you know, I've seen him, you know, up and down the lineup, play great physical hockey. So, when, you know, for me, when I'm talking about playoff hockey in years past, it's like, who is going to be that guy if the top guys are shut down and that's going to step up and score that big, big goal? When you look down this forward lineup, there's five, six, seven guys that could be, uh, you know, those unsung heroes on top of the Nylanders, Tavares, uh, Matthews, and Marners. So that's why I'm like, they it's just built a little bit differently, they're a little bit heavier. Um, they changed the narrative. Uh, on two, three games with Boston Bruins by going out and beating them up and they had to go get heavier in Pat Maroon. When's the last time you've seen that? The narrative has been this team has been soft. Uh, they've changed the narrative on that. So it just seems collectively that they're a different group, a stronger group. And, you know, I'm being accused of being an MLS EPR guy from a guy that's been there. They got a little bit more respect from their peers. And that's from the team, you know, former teammates that I've talked to, people that are in the media, people that are in the league. They're saying the Maple Leafs this year are a different team in years past. Everything comes back full circle, even dating back to Marshawn on Lilligren back uh, in November that started this entire conversation, right? As we get set for game one in Boston coming up on Saturday night. This interview is brought to you by Douglas, named Canada's best mattress on Canadian living. Douglas is loved by more than 200,000 Canadians and they're backed by over 10,000 five-star reviews. Every mattress order comes with a free comfort sleep bundle, two memory foam pillows with pillow protectors, one luxurious cotton sheet set and one mattress protector, Order today at douglas.ca slash LMT. That's douglas.ca slash LMT as you bring in 2011 Stanley Cup champion, the former head coach of the Boston Bruins. It is Claude Julian. What's going on, Claude? Oh, not much. Just uh, waiting for those playoffs to get going. I think I'm as, as excited as anybody else to see how these uh, series are going to turn out. 
Fired up. Um, I want to get your perspective. We were just talking about the Maple Leafs, the way they concluded the season with four straight losses. Uh, does that weigh into the mind? And I know you can't speak for Sheldon Keefe, but the way they ended it, like, would that dawn on you at all as you get set for the playoffs? I, I hope not, and I don't think so. Uh, again, you have to look at the other side too. Boston Bruins have, haven't really uh, finished on a high note either. So I think you got two teams there that if you look at their record in the last few games, it, you hope that it's uh, it's going to change once those playoffs start. And I've seen that happen before too. You know, uh, say what you want. There, there wasn't a, a ton uh, that both teams were risking. Uh, obviously, the Bruins went from first to second, but at the end of the day, it's still uh, they're in the playoffs. So I think uh, it's more about will they be able to elevate their game, both teams, and uh, they, they have different. To my uh, to my perspective, anyways, they got different challenges. Uh, you've won a cup with the Boston Bruins, but how much importance is it about having culture in an organization? And can you talk about the culture uh, instilled by former captains in Patrice Bergeron and Zdeno Chara? Well, Anthony, I think you're right. The culture is so huge when it comes to, especially in the playoffs. And, uh, you know, you've got uh, some guys in, in that dress room and even, you know, coaching staff, Chris Kelly, who was with us in 2011, who's now a coach. You got Brad Marchand, who was a rookie that year when we won the cup. Uh, he's been able to learn from guys like Chris Kelly, uh, obviously uh, Bergeron and uh, Chara and, and all these guys, Recky that was with us. Uh, it's important, I think, that uh, that culture continues uh, to be, I guess, passed on to the uh, the next generation. And now you're looking at the McAvoys and you're looking at, you know, at, at guys like that, Pasternak, and you hope that the, that culture continues to, I guess, uh, evolve and, and stay the same to a certain extent where you know what to expect from the team. And that's where Boston is right now. And if you ask me about Toronto, this is where Toronto has to create theirs. You know, they, they've been a great team uh, during the regular season for years now. Uh, now it's time to create that culture in the playoffs where last year they won a series. Uh, this year they need to take that next step. Identity uh, is a big word we use in this market quite a bit. Um, I'm sure you've been keeping tabs in the league. Uh, do, do you think the Leafs are a different team or at the very least, do you think they're harder to play against when it matters most and that's in the Stanley Cup playoffs? Well, you, you know, you look at some of the acquisitions they made, Edmondson, and uh, obviously on the back end, they've tried to get a little bit tougher. Uh, I really think, to be honest with you, the the key to, to the Toronto Maple Leafs right now is going to be can – their top players come out of their comfort zone. And when you look at teams that have success, and I remember, you know, watching uh, Tampa Bay before they won their, their Stanley Cups, uh, you know, the guys like Stamkos and, and Kucherov and those guys were just playing the same game they played during the regular season. The following year, I remember seeing guys like Stamkos again, blocking shots big time, you know, taking a hit to make a play. They were going into dirty areas and they finally caught on to what it took to win. And I really feel that the, the Leafs have to do that with, you know, all of their top players. You know, they everybody talks about the core five. And, of course, they, they're the ones that have to set the tone. But the rest of the team has to follow. And I think if they can get out of that comfort zone and realize that the playoffs is about bringing it up another notch, is going to be tougher. And uh, some of those guys have to lead the way so that the rest of the team can follow them. Um, you've obviously coached a, a while in the league and um, you know sort of the market that the you know the Toronto Maple Leafs are in but do you think there's an appreciation for the goal scoring prowess that Austin Matthews brings on a yearly basis you know flirting with 60 70 goals and uh, do you see that being a distraction going into the playoffs or that's something as a team especially a coach you should celebrate and try to get that momentum going into the playoffs well I think you, you said it right at the end there they should be celebrating the year that he's had like to me if I'm going into the last game, uh, which they played last night, I really don't care whether he gets 70 or not. Or not. I would like to see him get 70 because it's a, it's a great number. But at the end of the day and at the end of the game, it's like, what a year you've had. We should be celebrating that. And now it's time to move on. And uh, I think, again, like I mentioned earlier, let's take that next step. So let's push that aside. And now everybody... You know, as fans, you always want more, right? Until you win the Stanley Cup, you're never satisfied. And you hope that as players and as a team, you feel the same way. So going into the playoffs, as much as a lot of these guys have had great year, great years and have had success, 
what's that next step? Do we want more? And, and what are we willing to do to get more? And that's where their, I guess their situation is right now. Okay, so you're devising a pre-scout for the Boston Bruins, obviously an organization you know very, very well, Claude. Um, if you're the Maple Leafs, what are you looking to dissect? What are you looking to sort of break down to see, hey, maybe we could have an advantage here and there? Well, we all know, I think it's pretty obvious to everybody uh, that knows the team that the Bruins, you know, have great goaltending. They've got two of them that have been really good. Their back end is really strong, and so is their uh, D game, you know, defensive structure is very strong. So uh, where the Leafs, I think, have a, a, an advantage is definitely on the offensive side of things where they can score a lot more. Uh, I think the Bruins maybe lack a little bit of depth in the scoring area. So can the Toronto Maple Leafs uh, take advantage of, of trying to get to those dirty areas? You know, we talk about are they going to get to the net front, you know, and, and that means they're going to have to take some punishment. You know, they're, uh, it's not going to be easy, but if they play on the outside, they don't have a chance of winning this uh, series. So it's about wanting to get your nose dirty. And, and I mentioned earlier, you know, blocking shots, taking a hit to make a play. Uh, there's a team there that doesn't give much. So you're going to have to create and you're going to have to make those things happen. And a lot of it will not just be by skill alone, but it will be by commitment and dedication and wanting to go to those areas. I don't want to want you to give up too many uh, trade secrets for the Boston Bruins, but uh, if one of the X factors is obviously Brad Marchand, if I'm Toronto, do I get uh, involved in those theatrics? Uh, for me personally, I did not want to be on the receiving end of any of his chirps, so I left him alone. So do you leave him alone, or do you engage with him? And does he feed off that type of energy when he walks that line and and gets involved physically and uh, you know scoring goals as well? Well, there's a, a lot to answer on that, uh, Anthony, because yeah, I, I don't think as a Maple Leaf. You don't want to get caught into that because we all know that he thrives on that. Uh, the more he can get into your kitchen, the better it is uh, for him and for his team. Uh, he's been doing it for years. So uh, advantage to him if you get caught up in that. Uh, I think the Leafs have to focus on what they need to do in order to win. And their whole focus should be on some of the things I talked about earlier. about what are we going to do to beat this team? Is it going to be to try and... Uh, retaliate with Marchand or, or get caught up in, in what he's trying to do? Or is it going to be about us trying to get inside this hockey club and sc score some goals and win some hockey games? That's where your focus has to be, and uh, and it should be that way. And I think, that, again, the Maple Leafs, if you look at the rosters, I think it, it's pretty obvious that the Leafs roster is deeper. But then when you look at the culture and the structure, this is where you know the Boston Bruins – have had an advantage over a lot of teams for many years. So you got to try and get into that and uh, try and defeat that part of their game. A big topic of conversation has been the line shuffling and the constant line juggling. And uh, the last six weeks or so, they've been tinkering with, uh, you know, spreading out the wealth, if you will, with Matthews, Marner, and Nylander. Do you like that game plan at least to start here against a team like Boston? Like, I'm always so careful to dissect the Bruins. And Claude, you know this. Like, even without Bergeron and Krejci, there hasn't been a drop-off, right, with Zaka and Coyle, and just every player knows their role on that team. But do you think that's a good way to attack it, knowing that maybe Boston's depth isn't the same as maybe, say, like a Florida or other teams up the middle? Well, kudos to those guys that uh, stepped in for Krejci and uh, obviously Bergeron, like Coyle and uh, even Zaka. They've done a great job. But, you know, uh, with no disrespect, they're still not Bergeron, they're still not Krejci. So... Yes, there's a, there's a reason to want to take advantage of that if they can. Uh, again, their structure has held them uh, to where they are today, and that's one of the top teams in the league. And uh, we keep going back to that because everything that's happened over the past three, four years of, you know, from Chara leaving and, again, those two guys we just mentioned, again, uh, uh, retiring, it's, it, that team doesn't seem to miss a beat. And every year that that team starts and – Last year was the fact that Marchand and Coyle were out for the first few months, and they still managed to overcome that. This year was those two guys, two centermen, and they overcame that. So you can never, uh, I guess, discount that team because of the fact that they have uh, a culture that's been built in there, and, and everybody they uh, seem to bring on board uh, seems to buy into what they're doing. So that's one of the things that uh, I guess you have to give – them an advantage on and uh, at the end of the day this is a great opportunity I think for Toronto honestly to create their own culture by showing people they can take that next step 
And you know what, if they just want to rely on what they did all year and, and rely on her skill and, and, you know, the fact that they're great, the uh, goal scoring team and that they're exciting to watch that way. If they're just going to rely on that, I don't think they're, they're going to succeed. And I think it's important for them. Like I mentioned, teams that have won, you see them, you know, and then there's always a player that'll come up big in, in all these uh, things last year. You know, you look at Florida, they were one game away from being knocked out all of a sudden. Uh, and you guys all remember uh, Keith the Chuck saying they were a soft team and uh, it kind of woke them up. Right. And uh, all of a sudden they're now like they're, they're a pretty tough team. They pushed back a lot and they uh, went into the playoffs and they were a gritty team and uh, they learned what it took to, to be successful. That's what you want to see the Maple Leafs do. Yeah, there's still a couple of days for Ty Domi to hit the airways. Maybe he comes on this show and he's you know you know what like he just calls a team out. Very very unlikely. Um, how would you how would you handicap this series? Uh, take that Bruins chapeau off. Uh, just looking at this series, how would you look at it? Do you think the Leafs have a have a good chance? Like how do you break it down? This is one of those series where I really honestly put it 50-50. Uh, again, we talked about earlier. Both those teams didn't really finish on high notes, but again, we've seen that before where you know. Playoffs are starting, you know, Saturday, and I'm focused and I'm ready to go. And all of a sudden, uh, both teams start playing the way everybody knows they can play. Uh, again, you know, will the Leafs goaltending, which, you know, has been up and down all year, will they get great goaltending? Because they're going to need it, you know, and that's a, a important part of the game. And and they have had some great goaltending, you know, this year at times. So it's all about timing, right? You want to make sure they get that. I like the fact that, you know, when we're talking about, you know, they got a little bit tougher on the back end. I think they needed that. It's okay to have puck-moving defensemen that uh, can, you know, create some offense. But you also need guys that can defend and guys that can punish guys and discourage guys from going to the front of that. And that's why I thought that Edmondson was, a, you know, a, and Benoit were, were great acquisitions for that team to kind of, kind of balance things out. As much as I love doing this with you, uh, you're 63 years young, clearly watched the game, and you know what's going on. Uh, what are the chances we see you behind the NHL bench as soon as next season again? Well, you know, to be honest with you, I, I really felt that I needed a break after I left Montreal. You know, all these years of coaching from junior to uh, to the NHL, uh, I never had a full season unless it was a lockout, but we were still working at that point where I never was able to take a step back and you know, I realized that after I did, uh, felt much better. And uh, to be honest with you, I'd be ready to give it another go uh, under the right circumstances. No doubt, uh, I feel energized again and, uh, again, feel really sharp. And, and when I watch some of the games and some of the teams, you know, you sit back and say, I think I've got the answer to this, uh, to this hockey club here. So hopefully, uh, you know, uh, teams still have my number and uh, maybe I get a phone call at some point. I will, I'll just say it. I mean, you cracked the code just doing this 13-minute uh, interview about what the Leafs need to do in this first-round series. So uh, you're hired on my part. Uh, can't thank you enough, Claude, for uh, doing this today. Really, really appreciate it. Enjoy the first round, okay? Thanks a lot, Nick. Nice talking with you, Anthony. Thank you. Thank you. Our pleasure. Uh, Claude Julian, one of the best 2011 Stanley Cup champion. Yeah, I want to see him behind the bench. There's a lot of teams out there where I'm like, man, like you bring in an experienced coach and even hearing what Buffalo was saying the other day and firing Don Granado, they want experience. Well, there's, there's your experience right there, Stu. Yep. And uh, again, uh, I have a lot of buddies that played for him. And again, you see the knowledge that he has and, he does have the answers to these series for both teams, right? And he talked about Brad Marchand letting him sleep. Uh, Toronto, you know, having to get to the net, get to those dirty areas. So, you know, I know he's been sitting on the sidelines, but for the coaches, they're always thinking hockey. They're always thinking tactics. And that shows why, you know, he's been in this game so, so long. So very great hockey mind, well-respected and genuinely nice guy. So guys like that uh, definitely get another opportunity. And I'm sure if he wants to coach, he's going to be back coaching. And I'm sure he'll have a couple opportunities and a couple choices on where he wants to go hired uh but yeah it is fascinating to the coaching carousel and again i hope just as much as anybody else the leafs go on a very long playoff run but i mean if you're sheldon keith your job is on the line i mean i'm not like turning heads by saying that it's the truth and um if he can't get the job done it won't be the players like that's the problem it's the easiest scapegoat in hockey and and that's true to form here in this market where it's like they they're with these guys, man. They're coming back with the same guys. So regardless if they get the job done, there's got to be somebody who takes the fall. And just maybe the way it goes down, it could be Sheldon Keefe. But let's hope for a long playoff run for this Leafs team. I can't remember the last time 
there were this many like really, really highly qualified coaches available, right? Because Claude just mentioned there, he ain't finished. Craig Bruby, chief we had earlier on uh, in the season, Dean Evison. Like there's some really quality names out there and obviously some jobs uh, to grab. Yeah, so you're saying there's some teams maybe possibly hoping for not going on a long playoff run so they can <laughs> maybe take a run at some of these guys too. But uh, it's it's good. And, and I think some of these older guys have been around, um, you know, and they're still available because there's some young up-and-coming guys. You know, you saw yep. what Edmonton did in, in, in bringing in Knobloch as well. Uh, so I get it. But for me, it's you got to find a way to adapt. And the coach that finds success, you can't be coaching the same way you did in the early 2000s or, you know, I coached Brett Hall in 1992 and, you know, you got to do the same way. These kids coming up and coming from someone that works with young players, they are totally different. Uh, You know, there's the carrot and stick approach, but you have to find a way to coach each player individually. And it's very, very difficult uh, when you're stuck in your ways. But Claude Julian, he seems like he's one of those guys that adapt. Uh, He's staying current in the game. Uh, But again, that's sort of a message for some of these coaches. You have to find a way to adapt because I'm telling you, these kids aren't built the way that uh, you and I were built back in the day there. Muzzy. (laughs) Soft fucking league that's all i can are we allowed say. To say that are we allowed to say that on on internet radio internet but great podcast no. this is know. called a podcast stewie we have a yeah. chat which you're dialed into now you were <laughs> dialed in oh chat. i've dialed it someone called me a, a a talking point for mlsc a mouthpiece I'm, I'm rattled i'm gonna find them i'm gonna find their twitter account and uh, let them know <laughs> <laughs> no, great stuff. Um, should mention too now official via Elliot Friedman. The Maple Leafs are going to officially sign Cade Weber shortly. Um, we had Cade Weber on the podcast a couple weeks back from Boston University. So congratulations to him. Uh, they acquired him for a sixth round pick from Carolina just ahead of the trade deadline. So unfortunately, he's not going to make his NHL debut. Going to start next season, presumably with the Marlies. So that's the latest. Uh, it's time for the Great Clips uh, inbox question of the week. With more than 4,400 hair salons throughout the United States and Canada, Great Clips is the world's largest hair salon brand. An official hair salon of the NHL, salons are locally owned and operated and open seven days a week. Your time is valuable. Use the Great Clips check-in app, see the wait time, check in on your phone, and get your haircut when you want. The big question du jour here in the chat among many. A lot of people asking questions today. Your biggest X Factor for the Maple Leafs heading into the Stanley Cup playoffs, X Factor player, who is it? It has to be one player or a group of players. Whatever you would like. Uh, I'm going to say the big four, but I think Austin Matthews. And I think when he's on his game and he's got that confidence where he's just flowing through that zone, getting shots, I think the team sort of follows suit. So I think him scoring a lot of goals early in this game, he's been, has a penchant for scoring some big goals and, and, and getting game tying game winning goals. So I think for him, if he shows up now and has a, a five, six goal, seven goal series, I think Toronto wins this series. I'll go with, uh, I'm going to go with Morgan Riley. I think he had a strong postseason last year. I think it's quite clear uh, the matchup is going to be him against McAvoy, an all-world defenseman for the Boston Bruins. What kind of level can Morgan Riley get to on that blue line? Can it be the guy who was really, really strong last year, um, you know, in the playoffs, had a bad regular season, turned things on in the playoffs? Uh, Can he be that guy that we saw last year? If he is, like, they're going to need him to be, right? Because I think... It's fair to question Toronto's depth on that blue line. So Morgan Riley's the guy I would go to. Uh, for more information, check out greatclips.com. Great Clips, it's going to be great. Uh, Doodad writes in, was Anthony ever all-star? Was that the other Stewart brother? <laughs> I think you got the wrong group of black guys. I think it was Wayne Simmons, who's in our <laughs> friend group too. So I wasn't an all-star. I don't think my brother was. But uh, my brother did have a 70-point season one year with uh, the Colorado Avalanche. But uh no, I wasn't an all-star. I was an OHL all-star and world junior all-star. So I can hang my hat on that and, and tell my uncle Rico stories at uh, the local Boston, at the local, uh, at the local DoorDash for sure. Yes. Very well put. Um, Anthony is a Kingston Frontenac's legend. In fact, his number is in the rafters there at the formerly known K-Rock Center. It could be Leon Center. I don't know what it's called now. What's Hush it called? Puppy Center. <laughs> are you serious? Yep. These sponsorships are just getting ridiculous where... <laughs> I don't know what's next, man. We have the crypto arena. I don't know what is next. The solar eclipse arena. That won't sponsor, right? Yeah. Who knows? Who knows? Whoever's cutting those checks, checks, uh, I'll I'll wear whatever you need me to wear. Let's go. (laughs) I know you will. Like, uh, what's that hat you're wearing right now? It looks like a Sarnia Sting hat, but it's not, right? No, it's It's a Bieber hat. a Maple Leafs all-star hat too. So it's a Bieber hat too. It's one of the one that I got a big head. I got a seven and uh, three quarter head. So this is the only one that typically fits. So 
I thought you would have been like an eight and a quarter guy. So, oh, well, my head's not that big. Come on, you're the one with the big head. If we're if we're figuratively speaking and literally speaking, no. Yeah, I don't know. Somebody called me Jada Pickett on the podcast yesterday because of my new haircut. I just shaved my head and, and yeah, I got chirped. I've been getting chirped quite a bit lately in the chat. The eyebrow game. Uh, you you dish it out pretty good. I'm on X and trust me, I'm I'm on my phone eight hours a day and I'm there scrolling and I always see the odd chirp popping up for you. So you, I'm not saying you're welcoming it, but you're uh, you're a willing combatant when it comes to Twitter chirps. Hey, keep it spicy. <laughs> dude i mean you only live once social media is a fucking cesspool so might as well treat it like a cesspool i had an islanders fan pick apart a tweet i put out sarcastically in february saying the owls are missing the playoffs and this guy made his own graphic it's like dude instead of doing this whole post like why don't you get a fucking job okay because he spent his whole day grabbing <laughs> grabbing different oh. tweets of people uh, saying the Isles are going to miss the playoffs to post this on social it's like hey how about you get a job and you won't have to worry about finding my tweet from january 12th that's funny and again i'm not a big fan of those guys bringing up tweets from six years ago and again trust me i get the jack i, wonder why. I get the jack campbell uh vesna one i get that at least once a week and hey we, we we sometimes make mistakes in this world well, again if i knew everything i'd be sitting as the gm of the toronto media, or i'd be the commissioner of the league or an owner if i knew absolutely everything so you're going to get things wrong at times and again people do make mistakes so the fact yeah. that people are you know going online and searching for that come on come on yeah. throw up give us a break uh in terms of betting here on the show um your boy actually jay con who a mutual friend of ours works at nhl network radio one of the most dialed in betters i know from in, in the hockey world he is on the quinton byfield anytime goal tonight because i think he needs one more to activate a bonus i think it happened uh, the last couple days with a couple different players i think warren fogel is one of those guys so qb give me a qb anytime goal tonight bud that's a good, good pick. Is that he's sitting at 19 this year, right? Exactly. So 20 gets him a nice little bonus there too. Um, I'm trying to think what else is going on throughout the league. Ah, bu, 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 I have the over in Seattle, Minnesota, but maybe just your, I mean, your final thought here as we wrap just on the, uh, the Boston Toronto series, take the Maple Leafs cap off. Cause I know you do work and you work for MLSE pretty much. There you go. Who, who do you like in this series? Just be honest with us, man. Again, I, I I'm, I'm a big fan. A proponent of evolution of teams evolution of players and just the feeling with this group is different so i'm saying the toronto maple leafs Woo! in six and if you're a betting guy and picking the over of austin matthews five goals in the series so that's that's my prediction and if uh, there's any uh any problems with that uh, be sure to uh hit me up on social media at the golden muzzy Leafs and four. Leafs and four. Uh, we're going to make our official predictions on the show tomorrow. So uh, Anthony Stewart back in uh, the mix coming up. I think next week you're back with us. Uh, Jay Rozo is going to be back for tomorrow's show. Zach Phillips is going to drop by. All systems go for the Stanley Cup playoffs. It is the best time of year, Stewie. Thanks so much for today, bud. Always great working with you. One and only Anthony Stewart. Uh, many thanks to 2011 Stanley Cup champion Claude Julien for dropping by the show. You guys in the chat, just phenomenal job. We're really, really ramping up here our coverage, and so are you guys and watching it and being dialed in on a daily basis at the Leafs Nation 401. Leafs want to take wherever you find your podcasts. Uh, visit leafsnation.com as well. And thank you to producer Vic. We'll talk tomorrow. Take care. Make sure to check out more of our content right here on the Leafs Nation YouTube page. We got long form interviews, we got clips, we got epic rants by Jay Rozo. We simply have it all. And don't forget, you can find out much more at theleafsnation.com. Thanks so much for watching.